Joseph Duncan, and Daniel Barbosa. Tales of hauntings, murder, and scary mysteries. Every week, Twisted Twos dives into a pair of uniquely terrifying true stories that are worthy of a more in-depth look. For this week, we focus on two notorious serial killer and rapists. The first, Joseph Edward Duncan, whose crimes are so appalling you would think more people would know about him. And the second is Daniel Barbosa, a brutal serial killer whose hatred for women led him to kill. Get ready for Scary Mysteries Twisted Twos. Number 1. Joseph Duncan Ever since he was a kid, Joseph Edward Duncan has had a long history of committing sex crimes. At eight years old, he engaged in sex initiated by his two older sisters. At 12, he committed his first crime by raping a five-year-old boy. At 15, he was charged with raping a nine-year-old and went to juvie. While there, he admitted he already raped six boys. The following year at 16, that increased to 13 boys. And from there, Duncan continued on his path of rape and assault. At 17, he was arrested and charged as an adult for the rape of a 14-year-old boy at gunpoint. He was sentenced to 20 years for torturing that boy while in captivity, something that would be seen in his later crimes as well. Duncan only served 14 years of his sentence and then was released to a halfway house in Seattle when he was 33 years old. The thing with Duncan is that he had the uncanny ability to charm people, convincing them he was a decent human being. When he was first released, he lived with a man named David Walfert, who appeared on a parole board testifying that Duncan was not a threat. He even gave him a place to stay and loaned him money. It's believed Walfert didn't do so out of the kindness of his heart, but because the two had a gay relationship. Soon enough, Duncan was rearrested for violating his parole by owning a gun and using marijuana. This cycle of meeting people, homosexual men who would help him out, only to reoffend, then be released, would be common for Duncan. On July 6, 1996, two young girls, Carmen Kubius, who was 9 years old, and Samijo White, who was 11, went missing from a motel housing homeless families. At the time, Duncan was living and working in Bothell, Washington, where the two girls' bodies were found two years later. Their skulls had been crushed. Duncan later admitted to a victim and to investigators he had killed two young girls, although he didn't know their names. Around March of 97, Duncan violated his parole again by using weed. Before he was arrested, he quit his job, stole his girlfriend's car, and then headed for California before going to his father's home in Nevada. After leaving his dad's, he went back to California and took 10-year-old Anthony Martinez by knife point. Anthony's body was found on April 19, 110 miles in the desert. He was raped and had been beaten to death with his skull crushed like the previous victims. Duncan was again arrested on August 27, 1997 for his parole violation and sent to prison for three years. After he got out, he ended up staying at Dr. Richard Wackman's home. The doctor had testified before a parole board that Duncan wasn't dangerous, but luckily the board didn't accept his testimony. It's believed the doctor and Duncan had a sexual relationship. Duncan lived in Fargo then between 2000 and 2005 and many think he continued to kill. There were several disappearances of young adolescents and teens in the area where Duncan was also verified to be in proximity. In 2003, he then began traveling to Minnesota and Michigan so he could scuba dive during the summer. Several missing children were attributed to him there. He also continued molesting children up until 2005. During this series of assaults, Duncan began videotaping young children and his acts. In one event, he was arrested, and the judge set his bail at $15,000. However, a Fargo businessman named Joe Creary paid for his bail. He befriended this man and likely had a sexual relationship with him, too. After he was bailed out, Duncan had bigger plans in store. He bought night vision goggles and a video camcorder at Walmart, then he got bullets for a shotgun and a claw hammer. On April 15, 2005, he then rented a Jeep Cherokee and drove to St. Paul, Minnesota. 
He continued driving until he ended up in Idaho on Frontage Road, right in front of the home of the Groans. Duncan scouted that house for two to three days before finally breaking in. Once inside, he tied up Brenda Groan, her fiancé, and 13-year-old son using nylon zip ties. The two youngest children, 8-year-old Shasta and 9-year-old Dylan, were taken to Duncan's car. Duncan then went back inside and killed all three by bludgeoning each one to death. The two kids were taken to several remote locations and repeatedly tortured and raped. All of these heinous acts were caught on videotape by Duncan. Later on, he shot Dylan in the stomach using that shotgun. The boy, still alive, was later put out of his misery, according to Duncan, when he shot him through the head. Duncan then chopped up Dylan's body into pieces, threw it into the campfire, and then forced his sister, Shasta, into picking up the body parts from the burning embers. He filmed this incident too, and afterward he tried to kill Shasta, but changed his mind. After holding her for seven weeks, Duncan decided to head down to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho with Shasta on July 2nd, 2005. The two entered a Denny's restaurant where a resident immediately recognized Shasta. The customer told the manager, who then called 911. The cops pulled in with the lights blaring and arrested Duncan. The stories of Shasta and Dylan's ordeal were told directly by the young girl. She also later revealed where Duncan had taken them, leading police to find Dylan's remains. During trial, Duncan was handed six life sentences in Idaho and three death sentences in federal court. In California, he is scheduled to be given a life sentence for the death of Anthony Martinez. And finally, it looks like Duncan's time of torture and killing has finally come to an end. Number two, Daniel Barbosa. Known as the Mangrove Monster, Daniel Barbosa was born to a rich family in the small town of Analema, Colombia. Barbosa's father, who had a similar name to his son, was a local businessman. His mother died when he was two years old and his father remarried for a third time. From a young age, Barbosa was already highly intelligent. He did well in school, but his father didn't care. Every time the young child would reach out to his dad, he would be told he was useless and put down. Barbosa eventually stopped wanting to interact with his father and would lie and manipulate his way to escape from conversing with him. His stepmother wasn't any better. She preferred having a daughter and doted on his stepsister while punishing the young Barbosa. She would often take his pants off and hit him with a bully whip. When Barbosa got in trouble at school, she punished him by taking his pants off and forcing him to wear a dress. She then invited his friends from school to watch him which resulted in Barbosa being bullied at school even more. This caused the young boy to form a strong resentment against women and all things feminine. In the 40s, he went to a prestigious Catholic school where he excelled academically, but his family got into hard times and he had to quit. He ended up working as a door-to-door -door salesman to support his family. He realized he had a knack for convincing people to let him in their homes or having them purchase something from him. In one of these excursions, he met Alciria Castillo. The two moved in together, but life was hard, so he decided he would rob a shop owned by a client. He was arrested within hours, but escaped prison by simply walking out with the other officers after their shift was let out. By 1962, he met Esperanza and fell madly in love. He decided to leave Castillo, despite having two children with her, after his engagement with Esperanza, he found out she wasn't a virgin and even found her in bed with another man. This disgusted him and he manipulated her to feel guilty for not being a virgin. He convinced her that to make up for her wrong, she should bring him young girls so he could take their virginity in place of hers. Esperanza agreed and lured five young girls to their apartment. The young ladies were drugged so Barbosa could rape them while unconscious. The fifth victim realized what happened and told police so Esperanza and Barbosa were arrested in 1964. The latter served eight years in prison for his crimes and told himself next time he would rape someone, he would kill her too so there wouldn't be any witnesses. After serving his sentence, 
Barboso worked as a street vendor and TV salesman. On May 2, 1974, he saw a nine-year-old girl walking to school. He then lured her to a secluded area, raped her, and then strangled her to death. Sure enough, he stayed true to his word, and he left her body with the television sets he was transporting. The next day, he returned to dispose of the body and get the TV sets, but the police were suspicious and followed him. He was arrested and then sentenced to 30 years at the prison island of Gorgona, Colombia's equivalent to Alcatraz. Ten years into his sentence in 1984, Barbosa saw a rowboat on the beach. He jumped in and started rowing for the mainland. Police thought he was killed at sea because they said the currents would make it impossible for anyone to reach the mainland, but they were wrong. For years, Barbosa had been studying the current, reading books about it, and so he managed to reach land safely and headed to the Ecuadorian border. He was the first prisoner to ever escape the island prison. In December of 1984, he abducted and killed another young girl from the province of Los Rios in Ecuador. Then another 10-year-old disappeared the following day. It's believed that between 1984 and 86, just two years, Camargo abducted, raped, and murdered various victims in the area. Although police were aware of the killings and were actively looking for the killer, they thought the murders were the work of a gang because they didn't think one person could be responsible for so many deaths. During this time, Barbosa moved from place to place and slept on the streets. He earned money by selling ballpoint pens on the street, sometimes selling clothing or small valuables from his victims. He targeted young, lower-class girls who were looking for work. He would tell the victim he was a foreigner and looking for a Protestant pastor in the outskirts of town, adding that he needed to give him a large amount of money. He would show the victim the money as proof and said that if they accompanied him, he would give them a reward. If the victim felt uneasy and left, he wouldn't stop them. But for those that didn't, he would find an opportunity to corner them then rape and assault them before strangling the girls to death. He would then just leave the bodies in the forest where they would be picked clean by the animals. For two years, Barbosa went on killing until February 26, 1986. After he had murdered another nine-year-old by the name of Elizabeth, two policemen on patrol saw him and found he was acting suspicious. They stopped him and discovered he was carrying a bag filled with bloody clothes along with the clitoris of his latest victim. It took a while for Barbosa to be identified as himself because he gave out a false name. It wasn't until a former rape victim who escaped identified him. During his arrest, he confessed to killing 72 girls in Ecuador. He cooperated with authorities, showing them his dumping grounds, as well as the bodies of the victims that hadn't been recovered yet. Police discovered that he not only raped and killed his victims, but he dismembered them using a machete. He said the reason he chose children was because he wanted virgins because they cried. For him, he wanted to punish women's unfaithfulness. Barbosa was sentenced to 16 years in prison, the longest allowed in Ecuador. While his crimes were horrific enough, there was another person, Pedro Alonso Lopez, who was said to have raped and killed more than 300 victims, also in the same prison with him. Before he could get out, Barbosa was stabbed to death in prison in November of 1994 by Giovanni Noguera. As it turns out, he was a nephew of one of Barbosa's previous victims. So there were two of the most violent and scary stories around. The world can be a crazy place, and Twisted Twos is always sure to show you why. If you like this video, then please remember to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday for you to check out. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you soon.